Welcome back to the Sip and Feast podcast, episode number 34. Today, we're going to cover nonstick, stainless, cast iron, all the pans. We're going to try to get to all of them today and give a little bit of information. When's the best time to use which particular pan? Does that sound good, Tara? I think that sounds great. And for a little bit of background here, we decided to do this episode because we've gotten a lot of questions about you know, when folks should use a cast iron as opposed to when they should use a nonstick. So there's so much information to kind of hash out. We thought it would be good to just do an entire episode focused on it. Yeah, I agree with that. We get a ton of questions about that from whether it's instant messages on uh, Instagram or long emails about it. And listen, I'm going to give you my general take on it and there's a ton of science on this. Don't really want to go too much into that today, but do want to talk about what is the best use case for which particular item. I mean, honestly, I could end this podcast in a second and just say use stainless steel all the time, but we're going to uh, hash it out a little bit more than that. And many of you might be frustrated with stainless steel and you might say, that's why I'm using nonstick most of the time. Before we get into it, nonstick is the most purchased pan in America by home cooks by a landslide. Really? Does I that make that. sense? It does make sense. I'm not surprised, but I didn't I didn't know that. Purdy Atlantic, it said, I think it said 70%, but there were about 10 other articles that were saying the same thing. I did not see any article say below 60%. So okay. that means that all the other pans, other types of pans. Are, have have very small market share compared to hmm. nonstick. And I'm trying to put myself in the situation of a beginning cook or maybe five years of cooking, maybe 10 years of cooking. Yeah. And you'll just see nonstick pans everywhere. And there's nothing wrong with using nonstick pans. We will go into that later too, but there are better pans to use and we'll go into why there are better pans to use. Nonstick certainly seem less expensive. They are much cheaper. People think of them almost as disposable. I mean, should we just get right into nonstick now? And just, I think let's address that one. All right. So Jim, let's talk about the pros and cons of nonstick pans. Pros of nonstick pans are definitely it's nonstick use. It's you can't, or I shouldn't say can't, it's extremely difficult to cook say, eggs without sticking in a stainless or cast iron. It's even harder to cook, say, a piece of fish Mm -hmm. without it falling apart. Can it be done? Yes. You're talking about cons of stainless steel pans. No, I'm talking about the pros of nonstick. Okay, but you said you can't. Cook. Yeah, well, but this, okay, so those are cons of those pans, but this is a pro of nonstick pan. Okay, so, so stick to yeah. the pros of nonstick pans. So again, pans. the pr- pro is that it's nonstick, so you can cook a piece of fish in there. Mm-hmm. It's very difficult to cook a piece of fish without it breaking apart in another type of pan. So a lot of people like it for that. A crepe, same thing. Omelet. Omelet, when you're making... um. You know, when you're making the crepes for, say, Manigot, mm-hmm. same, same exact thing. It's It gets a lot harder, and you don't really get any upside by using a different type of pan. You're best to stick to using a nonstick pan for, that, for mm-hmm. those type of applications. That's the pros of a nonstick. Another pro of nonstick is its cost. They are extremely inexpensive. Yeah, they're also available pretty much everywhere. They're everywhere. They're in every home kitchen. Mm -hmm. They come often included in, even if you buy like a full 10-piece set of cookware, even if it has some stainless steel in it, they'll also throw in some nonstick. It's cheap. Typically, well, what is nonstick? What's it made of? It is made of a coating, and most people will think of nonstick, and they'll just call it Teflon, because Teflon, which was created, I think, in the 1940s, is the brand that kind of brought it forward, probably had the patents on it, but now all different brands do make a non a nonstick pan. It's typically a coating. It no longer has the um, 
So actually, I'm just going to read something to you. So today's Teflon, which is nonstick, it's considered safe cookware because there is no evidence that it increases the risk of developing cancer. If you have Teflon pans that were manufactured prior to 2013 and you're concerned about the chemicals they may contain, try to replace them with newer Teflon. And it's highly doubtful that anybody would have a nonstick pan still laying around from 2012. Probably not. Right? I mean, I because mean they're they not, don't they don't last. They're not durable. Too long. They're exactly. not too durable. Exactly. Yeah. So people get very nervous about this. Yeah, I remember and, that back in. It must have been in 2012 or so. I remember them yeah. talking about it. Yeah, and we discussed uh, last week. Actually, I think it was last week's episode. We we discussed about MSG and how people are conditioned to. Mm-hmm. Older people don't want to use MSG. It's the actual opposite scenario here. Older people love nonstick. Younger people are super conditioned to reject yeah. all nonstick cookware if they have the financial means to do so. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of a class thing involved here too. It's it's an age thing. I'm sure there's people that are very wealthy that can afford to you to do all carbon steel pans, and they'll pass on them because they want the ease and you know easy usability of nonstick. But then there's a contingent, I believe, of younger people. And because we get the comments all the time where most of them are on the YouTube videos or whatnot. They're like, I can't believe you used a nonstick there. I mean, there are there's just a contingent of people that are 100% against nonstick pants. Yeah, I think a lot of the comments that we get, though, are more about you using certain utensils when you're using a nonstick pan, like if you use a metal spoon in a nonstick pan, even if you are very careful to not scrape the yeah. bottom of it, people always comment on that. You would never want to take a metal utensil and, and really scrape the bottom. But I think in one of the episodes, you were just kind of like using a spoon to taste yeah, even, the sauce in yeah, it the and people thing. were simplest upset. Thing. And it seemed like they didn't understand that you were not scraping the bottom. You I, just... I think I could make a, a video and just make it sauce in a pan and me just taking a spoon in there yeah. and just like just eating it without even me talking and <laughs> probably would get hundreds of comments. You would get yeah. infuriate people with that. Yeah. Um, so that actually kind of brings me to mention since I'm since I'm the cleaner, <laughs> the cleaner, of, the cleaner of the pans in in the sip and feast household. Um, I like how easy. It is to clean oh, a nonstick yeah. pan. I mean, we're, we're going to talk about some of the others like stainless and, and cast iron. And certainly those are a little bit more nuanced when it comes to cleaning. Yeah, we, we will mention them. We want to kind of mention these one at a time. I don't want, we will do a brief mention too. I don't want you to confuse nonstick, the traditional nonstick. And by the way, the nonstick coating is applied to most of the time it's aluminum because aluminum pans are cheap and light but also it can be coated onto a stainless mm-hmm. or an iron, so something much heavier, but I, that's exceedingly rare. I don't really know brands that do it, but in my limited research here, I did come across that. Hard anodized, we'll talk about, that's a little different, which I think Tara might be mistaken the one she's cleaning, thinking it's a kind of a Teflon pan, but in actuality, it is a hard anodized. We'll save that for after, though. Let's move on to the next one. All right, so Jim, seems like stainless steel is one of your favorite types of pans yeah. to use. Heck yeah. Talk to us about the pros and cons of stainless steel. So stainless steel is my favorite type of pan to work with, to use. 95% of the time, I will use a stainless pan. It's relatively affordable if you buy certain brands. I like the Tramontina brand. They're very good value for the money. Costco's brand too, which for all I know could be Tramontina. They put just put the Kirkland on there. And then you could go all the way up to high end like all clad, which I've never seen a difference between a Tramontina and all clad as as far as use goes. And I have, you know, I have both. But the thing about stainless steel is it will allow you to get perfectly even heating in the pan. If it's heated up properly, it will not stick. It's not non-stick, but your food won't stick. Tell us about that when okay. you say heat it up properly. Because so, I know what you're yeah. talking about, but I didn't know about this 
until maybe a year or two years ago. So tell us what you mean by that. I mean, we get the comments all the time. I, I literally think we have over 2,000 comments about this from emails and everywhere else about thank you showing me how to use a stainless pan. I'm not sure if other channels are just kind of gl like glossing over it or whatnot, but it can be confusing because the first time I used a stainless pan, which was probably 30 something years ago, all my food just stuck to it. Mm -hmm. Same. Completely stuck to it. And then I can imagine that trips up people and they say, I'm never, never using, using this pan again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to uh, nonstick. Yeah. You know, simply put, to make it not stick, you just need to heat up your pan to medium heat. 90% of the time, you want to just use medium heat on stainless steel. You don't need to go higher than that. You do it to medium heat, wait three minutes, set a timer, just, just wait. Then when you put your oil down, your oil is gonna essentially float on the top of the stainless because the, basically, this is a little science here. If you put your oil down right away on your cold aluminum pan, it will go into the pores versus if you let the pan heat up and the metal, they expand. So it's like chemistry, the, the particles get like wider or whatnot. Mm -hmm. It basically creates this impenetrable surface surface and the oil floats on top of it mm -hmm. your chicken goes on top of it you get a beautiful sear Without with a sticking. lot of with a lot of <laughs> fond <laughs> yes and <laughs> and and it's beautiful and i do it in all the videos i always like to show i always like to show how to heat it up i like to show the lead in frost effect well tell folks what the what that is so the lead in frost effect is when you put the little bit of water on there just take a little bit a little splash of water just wet your hands in the sink, just go like this, little balls will form and the, it will like dance on the surface. That's how you know that your pan is ready for oil. It's really cool, actually. Yeah, that's all you have to do. It's like a Mr. Mr. Wizard. It's a Mr. Wizard, exactly. Yes. That is I'm, what it is. We're showing our age, Yeah, Mr. Wizard. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's Inspector really Gadget. good. And wasn't it the frugal gourmet who would always say hot pan, cold oil? I don't know. I mean, I had to learn this, I think, on my own. I can't tell you how many even like pro sites are like put the oil down yeah. into a cold pan. I think it I think it was I think it was that I can't remember his name, but mm. he was the frugal gourmet and I think he always said hot pan cold oil and then you'll have a nonstick surface. Do, do you know why I think a lot of people are glossing it or not saying it? Because all those comments we keep getting about how and how we solve the mystery for people. Yeah, so maybe it's just not something that people talk about. Yeah, now, I mean, can you do it the other way? Maybe, I would always get sticking, so. That's why I never liked using stainless steel pans because anytime I did use it and I was making something like chicken probably is what it was. Yeah, so I think that's what always deterred me from using a nonstick pan because if I would use it, it would always, like whatever I was making, like whether it was chicken or, or something else, it would just always stick to it and it was not a good user experience for me. And then once I learned from you about the lead in frost effect and the putting the cold oil on the hot pan, I forgot what I made, but I was like, this is. Are you perfect with it now? Like, do you ever have problems yeah. or not? No. Yeah. No. So I think people should. It's so easy to to use it if you're using it properly. Yeah. And it's a really good experience, I think. Now, I will say, if you go, if you heat it a little too high, then you're gonna start to run into issues. So for stainless, because it does conduct heat so well, once you know how to use it, then then you're set. The other thing is, as far as durability of a pan, it's, they're extremely durable. It's not, a stainless pan is not a full, it's not fully thick stainless steel. It's a stainless steel ply coating, and that will come into why certain brands, like All Clad has like their five ply, mm -hmm. and I think their seven ply. So supposedly it's a thicker coating, which will conduct heat better than say a Tramontina, which I think is a three ply. I have a question. Yeah. Are all stainless steel pans oven safe? Stainless steel are completely oven safe. Yeah, completely. So all of them, no matter yeah. what, as opposed to a nonstick pan, which would never be oven safe. Is that right? So non-stick are... pans are not oven safe, but they, I mean, I think there are some pans that are sold and marketed that they can be put in the oven, though I think they are probably hard anodized pans, anodized pans instead okay. of the traditional 
Teflon uh, nonstick. Yeah, because there are some like baking pans that are not that seem to be nonstick. Yeah, that can go in the oven. Yeah. Well, we'll go into later, you know, about about the the difference between those. But you know, bringing it back to stainless steel, it's are these going to last you a lifetime? I I think they are with proper maintenance. Mm-hmm. And what's your favorite ingredient to clean them with, Tower? <laughs> so we're not sponsored by this company, but they're one of my favorite brands and it's barkeeper's friend. I can't tell you how many, like how many times you have made a pan look like it's been through the ringer. Like it looked like it went to war with (laughs) just the other day. I cooked something. Yeah. I can't remember what it was. And I was like, Oh my God, is the barkeeper's friend going to work with this? Sure enough. I mean, it restores it to brand new. Yeah. It looks brand new. And we get a lot of comments too about that. They say, how do you get your pans brand new again. I mean, a lot of them are accusing me that I'm switching, using a new pan each time. Mm. And no, we're not. You can actually tell why I'm not using it, wh- where the rivet is, like the little hole. You'll see some of the remaining like That's residue. Where That's the hardest part to the clean. The sponge can't get there. Yeah. We should do a video maybe like a, of me clean. <laughs> yeah. Does anybody really want to watch me clean a pot? Probably not. But we, no, people we could love that do that. Stuff. Yeah. But what's good about it First of all, if you are going to use Barkeeper's Friend, I recommend using the powder yes. instead of the liquid. I think the powder is a little bit better. Um, I just will sprinkle it on. First, I'll wash it, right? I'll wash whatever residue is is on there. Then I'll sprinkle the Barkeeper's Friend Sometimes you can wash it. the pan without using Barkeeper's Friend. Yeah, you Friend. can. You can yeah, if you but, had like a, not a big mess. Yeah, but whatever you did to it the other day, it was like be, I thought it was beyond repair. So I would wash it first, get like whatever oil grease is, is off of it, and then put it to the side, sprinkle the barkeeper's friend, just like gently like rub it in, let it sit for a few minutes and then yeah. wash it with the barkeeper's friend, wash it again with soap to get the barkeeper's friend off of it. Yeah, and you it's like re- brand new. You want to remove, obviously remove it. Well, it's the same thing you would want to remove soap. Yeah. It's awesome. And you know, as far as can you damage a stainless steel pan, you can. So let's say you aren't going to listen to me. Let's say you don't, you're saying, Jim, I don't want to use medium heat. I'm going to use screaming hot, like a million recipe blogs say on their posts, which all 1 million of them are wrong. Okay. They're wrong. But let's say you don't believe me and you believe the million. If you do that and you're heating your pan up and say you three minutes or two minutes, and then, you know, your kid, you know, you calls you in, you got to change them or you know, there's an issue going on and it's 10 minutes later and you warp your pan. This is a definite thing will happen, okay? It's harder to warp a stainless pan than it is, say, an aluminum pan, but it will happen. Uh, do you know how to fix it again? And what you'll know when it's warped is it won't be flat anymore. When you stick it on, like say, like a table like this here, you put it down and it'll just be like, you know, a little bit cupped. So the warping happens from getting it to, too hot. Too hot. So how to fix it? I don't know. Bang it with a hammer? Yes, but not a regular hammer. I would say a rubber mallet. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want to. Hey, I've done it before. I I had one the other day that it happened to, and I, and I was able to bang it out. Why? Did you get it too hot? Stainless, yep. It was a stainless so pan. So you, you went against your own yeah. advice? Why? Yeah. I don't even know how that one got out. It was a brand that, a company that sent us a whole bunch of pans, okay? That whole set we mm-hmm. got. I don't want to mention it because I don't want to like bash the company, but I was able to take out the dent. It wasn't, a, it's it's a, mi- it's a minor dent. So it's essentially, it's just, it was a little bit lower there. So it would be like no longer flat. It was like maybe able to rock by like a quarter degree on each side. But it it dented because you got it too hot? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. So then it's not the, it's not the company's fault. It's your yeah. fault. Well, I don't know if I got it. I mean, I think I still had it on medium yeah. though. Okay. I was a little frustrated. I think it was like the first time I used the pan, mm-hmm. but, but anyway, I fixed it and I fixed, I fixed other pans in the past with this. That's not going to happen if you're using a cast iron, you're not going to, you're not going to misshape it with a little bit extra heat. So Jim, you talked about getting a good sear on different foods with a stainless. What are some examples of meals you would cook in a stainless steel pan. So this applies not just to stainless, but this the same exact principle would work here with cast iron. So, you know, you can kind of like, this will lead into the next one. But a stainless pan, when you heat your pan up properly, you put your oil down and you say you're doing, let's just, for example, let's just say chicken thighs. And you 
cook them for five minutes undisturbed. What are you developing on the other side there, Tara? Well, fond. Yes, fonds, okay? Brown fond bits. or brown brown bits. What's happening is the caramelization, the proteins, everything that's hitting the pan, it actually sticks, parts of it stick. And then those parts get browner, which essentially gives you your fonds, okay? Now, when you use an aluminum pan that is a perfect brand new aluminum pan with a coating, a non-stick aluminum pan, the whole point of that pan is so nothing sticks. So you're not gonna be able to really develop any of those brown bits, mm -hmm. okay? Brown bits are fond. Um, it's on the chicken itself, if you would use this exact same example, but the saying goes that you don't really get like better flavor until the fond that's left on the bottom of the stainless actually starts to really caramelize and get towards that darker stage Obviously, if it gets too dark, you might have a burnt sauce, but what you can do is as you're developing it, you can just deglaze. You could take that liquid, you could pull it out of your pan, and then you can continue with your next batch of chicken if mm -hmm. you're gonna do a sear. That's the difference. That's like the, supposedly what makes it a lot better to cook in something like this. It's, for me, it's the, the heat distribution is better. It's a more durable pan. Obviously, you get better brown bits. You can cook anything in there, but it's harder to cook a piece of fish than than you would in a nonstick pan. Like you're not gonna really be able to make crepes in there. You're, you're, there's a few things you're not gonna be able to do well in a stainless steel pan. All right, I think that pretty much covers it. Mm -hmm. But stainless is the workhorse in our kitchen. It's not the workhorse most of the time in restaurants, believe it or not. Before we go into the next one, Tara, do you know the workhorse in most commercial kitchens? Aluminum. Yeah, why is that? Well, they're light, right? Yeah. Is that one of them? They're like, they're not heavy. So they're easy to like flip, I guess, when you're or, making like pan sauces, things like that. Or if you're making, you got to make a massive thing of stock and you have a 48 quart stock pot. Wouldn't it be nicer oh, yeah. to be aluminum? I, I wasn't even thinking of that. Yeah. I was thinking of like a, like a little frying pan, like the one that they use, like they use so many of them. Yeah. They're also inexpensive. Very inexpensive. Right? Very dent. They get dented, warped. Yeah. And I'm not talking about non-stick, like I'm not talking about aluminum with the non-stick coating, I'm just talking about straight aluminum, mm -hmm. which straight aluminum is barely ever seen in house, in home cook mm -hmm. kitchens, but they're dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. You could get them at Restaurant Depot or any restaurant supply store. Uh, the reason I know that the, they're the most used in restaurants from my friend who owns a restaurant, but also from um, webstaurantstore, Dot com, which is the largest uh, supply store in the United States. It actually says on the site, it says that, I think it said 60% of all of all the stuff in the commercial kitchens are aluminum, which, yeah, it's. I think it's hard if you're a restaurant owner, you know, you're not a big restaurant, you're just getting by. You, you gotta, you, you can't do the outlay on stainless or forget about it. Like, you know, people see these copper pans and stuff on TikTok. Those are not regular restaurants. Those are, mm -hmm. you know, it's like La Bernadon or something like that. You yeah. Know? Like the Four Seasons or or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A little, a little fancy there. Yeah. But I used to use aluminum and I don't really like them. Uh, I, I mean, if you have the money, just use stainless steel. All right. Let's move into the next segment. Next is one that I think is romanticized a bit, and that is cast iron. What are the pros and cons of using a cast iron pan? So cast iron pans share a lot of the pros of stainless. They can get an even better sear on a steak. So that gives them an advantage, I think, over a stainless. Mm -hmm. It's a larger piece of metal. Heat distribution, once you get it hot, is better, like the idea is it'll be hot all around more evenly. And the downsides are you have to season it, which kind of, you know, you don't have to. I really don't season my cast irons. I just, I don't really- you oil I, them. Yeah, I oil. I don't, I don't really care, you know? I'm like not going to be, like some of these purists will sand the bottom of the pan to get it like baby butt smooth, and then they'll do like 12 layers of seasoning on it with the goal of being able to cook an egg mm -hmm. with nothing in the pan. And I've seen it done on some videos, but uh, no, I mean, I like, I like cast iron. I just don't find it nearly as useful as stainless steel. Like I can't f emulsify pasta with a cast iron pan. You have to be the, the Hulk to do it, you know? <laughs> like, like, you know, the thing, like a 12 inch one weighs like 20 pounds. I mean, forget it. Yeah, they are harder to 
to wash. I hate yeah. whenever I like when you use the cast iron, but I but I also don't like it because it's it's heavy, it's bulky, it's kind of a pain to clean. But if there's an intruder in the house, yeah, then. You have the ultimate weapon. That's true. Yeah, they, they are. I mean, they are really heavy, and you know, be careful when you're. You, know, you drop that thing on your foot; it's game over. Yeah. Oh, you know? forget it. You drop a stainless or a aluminum pan. You know, I mean, well, you'll be all right. Break a toe, but this will yeah. like smash the bones. This will cut your toes off. Yeah. You know, that's the thing when they um the metal tipped work boots. Yeah. What do they do? Drop a cast iron on them to test no, their but durability? No, certain, certain companies, depending on where you're working, they won't let their workers use them because if they're working with extremely heavy items and they hit the steel-tipped toes, they will cut. People have had their whole toes cut off completely because the metal itself goes like that. Oh, the, yeah. the shoe itself yes. is actually cutting the yeah. toes. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. I'm getting lightheaded. I know. I know, but whatever. <laughs> That's not going to really apply to people in the kitchen, but, you know. Yeah, I mean, cast iron's good. It's, again, better steak. They say you can't use acidic foods or you shouldn't use too many acidic foods. Again, I don't really care about that either. And when we get the comments, like, they're like, oh, bro, you put tomatoes in the in the cast iron, it's over. They're like, game over, bro. I'm like, all right, it's, it's okay. You know, it will be all right. <laughs> I'm going to go off on a tangent. I think it's so funny that, like, the latest word is bro for everything. Like our kids are calling us bro. I know. All the time. And girls use it too. Sammy says Sammy it. Sammy does it all yeah. the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Why? Why bro. do you think that, ha how has that evolved? It's, you got no riz. You got no riz, bro. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Sorry for the tangent. So, I mean, I don't know about what else to really do with cast iron here. Oh, cleaning is a little bit more difficult too. You don't really want to put soap in there you don't want to put you can't use the barkeeper's friend it's really just like a sponge and right? hot water they say a lot of times if you did a messy thing just yeah. put hot water and bring it to a yeah, boil yeah you can bring it to a boil and then i'll i'll always i know it's not really seasoning it but i'll oil it oil it with yeah a high heat oil like avocado oil yeah i wouldn't oil it with like an extra virgin olive oil or anything like that yeah i mean i do put a little olive oil sometimes because i know if i'm going to use it fairly uh Quickly, if the, the the thing is, if you put olive oil and you don't use it, it can. Yeah, if you don't use it for six months, it can go like rancid. rancid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's hard for me to ever rec recommend cast iron over stainless steel. What about for like fajitas? Yeah, I mean, I think it's cool to have them, and I actually purchased a couple because I want to do a video, a fajita video. That would be cool. Yeah, I and, love your fajitas. You've been yeah. making those for years, so I think it's time that you share that recipe with the world. Oh, it's um, nothing special. It's still, it's yeah. still so good. Um, I, what do I use the cast iron for? I don't know. I, I really don't There's know. There's something I make frequently. Oh, yes, yes, yes. What a frittata. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That, a frittata is really good for, a, with a cast iron. It is. And yep. I use the 10 inch one that we have. Is it 10 or 12 inch? That is a 12. I, no, it's, I, yeah, it's like this an 11. Yeah. yeah it's an odd number. Okay. That's yeah. the one I use and I love it. Yeah, no, you do use that and- one other thing about cast iron, it's really good for bread, but not the non-enameled ones. So like the larger cast iron Dutch ovens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll go on to the next one, which is aluminum. And we did briefly talk about it. So regular aluminum is what nonstick is just a nonstick coating on top of that regular aluminum. Regular aluminum are very inexpensive, very inexpensive. And yeah, you won't find them in like your standard stores. You will have to go to a restaurant supply store or or online. I don't really know what else. We already mentioned it, so I think we can quickly go into the hard anodized. Yeah, and then the carbon steel. And the carbon steel. So hard anodized is what I think you were talking about before that you like cleaning. That T file is a hard anodized. That is not a non-stick. Oh, really? That's right. The one that we use for like... Everything? Yes. I think that's part of the reason why it's been so durable. I didn't know that. <laughs> it hasn't gotten okay. messed up. I always thought that was a nonstick. Okay. Yeah. So the My bad. An anod My bad, bro. It's all Bruh. right. You still got you still got some riz. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the anodized process is, it's like changing the metal itself. So it's not technically a coating. I looked this up. It doesn't really make sense to me. Apparently- if you take something that is, say, an eighth of an inch thick or, or whatnot, 
when you anodize it, you're going halfway in and ch changing the properties of the metal. So if you were to remove it, it would have to be done industrial process to remove it. It would remove half of the thickness of the pan hmm. versus Teflon pan or traditional nonstick. That's a coating on top of it, which is more easily scratched and ruined. And that's where all the health, that's where all the health concerns and everything come in. So with hard anodize, you can't really remove the coating. Okay. That being said, I think you're still not supposed to use metal utensils on it, but it can go in the oven. So again, that's the advantage there. So mm -hmm. there, I think hard anodize is good. I don't know, I don't have enough experience with it. We do have one pan, it's that all clad pan, and it works really well. I just made a recent recipe, uh, garlic butter steak bites. I did it oh, in that that's pan. that's right, yeah. 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 It's a good pan. It's it very cheap too. They're like this is like the all clads cheap line. It's sold at Home Goods, and I think we bought the pan for like twenty bucks. And mm -hmm. you know, I like black pans for uh, for photos, right, Tara? Yeah, because they don't reflect. They just look so much better. You get they that do. beautiful contrast yeah. in the photos. That's one thing that we always have to take yep. into consideration: is yeah. that the food that we're making is being photographed. That's it. We try I mean, not to. <laughs> stainless looks kind of looks like garbage in photos because it's too shiny. Yeah. Shiny is the enemy of uh, any food photographer, shininess. So that's why I like plates that, this is like more of like a stylist thing. They will always use uh, matte plates mm -hmm. instead of anything with gloss. And it's very hard to find matte plates anywhere. Everything is gloss, everything, because it's, gloss is easier to clean. Like food comes off of mm -hmm. gloss e easier. That was just a little insight on on the photos we go through because I've been shooting photos for six years, all this stuff, and the processes uh, that I employ have adapted. Yeah. Speaking of that, can we just take a moment to reflect on that it has been six years at this point? Wasn't this, this was like the time of year, it was right after Christmas. This is the time of year that you came home with your camera. Yeah, it's been... Is it, has it been six or se it's been seven, right? With the camera? 2018. 2018. Okay. So six. Yeah. It's been a long time. It feels like a long time. We were actually looking at, I, I look at competitors uh, on our website specifically, and I look at competitors to motivate me. And I actually look at it to what's po like to find out what's possible. So I was looking at one, it's a very popular website. It's called uh, Spend With Pennies. And I think she's been doing it for 15 years. I think the site's, I always check how old the website is. The best comparison is always for me to see how many recipes they have versus us. So we have about 450 on our site now, and she has 2,500. So, you know, yeah, it made me feel pretty good. It, yeah. it did, you know, I mean, it's just, yeah, she's gonna be more visible that site. I mean, it's, it's one of the biggest sites. I, you probably know this site. That site, Sally's Baking Addiction, Natasha's Kitchen. Recipe Tin Eats. Recipe Tin Eats, Serious Eats. These are all very, very large sites. And that is what we strive to become. And we will, we will become that because of you. Because of you making our recipes all the time and leaving comments on the site, giving it, giving it the five-star ratings, which we adore. And, uh, and we take it... Uh, you know, we take it all seriously, but no, uh, they're competitors in a good way. I like to see what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely motivating. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. I want to get into questions, yeah. but before we do that, let's talk about one more type of pan. Okay. Carbon steel. Carbon steel. Carbon steel are awesome. I don't use them. Um, they're very expensive. So they're, they're, they're high end. You can look on, go on Amazon and just type in any, go type in 12 inch carbon steel pan, which again is what I recommend. I don't recommend a family you know, you're listening to me, you're probably cooking for your family or cooking for, you know, you, you don't want a really small pan. So a 12 inch pan might be a hundred bucks. It has all the properties of a uh, cast iron, but much lighter. So you can pick it up, you can flip. They're not light, but they're way lighter than, than a cast iron. Um, they need to be seasoned though. You have to season them and you have to clean them and dry when they're wet, they need to be dried off immediately. So this is the same thing if you have a carbon steel knife, which you will undoubtedly know if you have one and you didn't clean it, it will rust. But if you do get surface rust on your pan when you forgot, you can buff that off. And then just make sure from that point forward, after you uh, wash your pan, you dry them, you could even do a thin coating of oil all over your pan. 
Do we have a we carbon have one. steel pan? We have one. Yeah. Have Bell, I, don't have even I ever use had it. to clean it? I don't even no, remember. You know, I just don't use it. It's just it's it's hard to justify any of these other pans compared to the easy use and usefulness of a stainless steel pan. It's in my opinion. It's yeah. just my opinion. Now you might be saying what Tara, the, the frustration Tara was having that everything was sticking. Now that you know how to not make it stick, go back and use those stainless pans that maybe you put in the back of of uh, cabinet, and I, I think you're gonna love them. Mm -hmm. But if you do use nonstick, I from from the limited amount of research I did, it's not the it's not the end of the world. The problem is though, if you do scratch it, you really do need to dispose of it because that's where they say it can cause some some potential health issues. We do use nonstick, but. The bulk by far is is stainless steel mm -hmm. in in our household. Yep. And then you know we didn't go into the pots. The pots we have are the enamel Dutch oven too. But we want yeah. to stick more to pans in this episode. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we talked. A, I feel like we talked a lot about the Dutch ovens and and pans in the Le Creuset Costco episode. Yeah. Anyway. I mean, frequent frequent listeners here will know about that. But you know, if it, if if you're a new listener, then yeah. you know then. Yeah, we use, we use enameled Dutch ovens. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go into the questions. This is from John. In the video for Three Meats, Meat Lovers, New York Sicilian, you're going to have to take a, take a trip back in time because it's an old video. You mentioned not to use extra virgin olive oil to oil pizza pans, just regular olive oil or some other neutral such as canola or perhaps grapeseed oil, which has a high smoking temperature or even shortening. Other than a waste of money, since high heat destroys the flavor, is there any particular reason why one would not use olive oil? Extra virgin, he means, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah John, you can use extra virgin. You definitely can. I think now, again, if this, this video is probably three years or four years old, three years old. I don't really remember exactly what I said. Uh, in fact, I don't remember anything at all about it. But I, <laughs> I know that I was the point I was probably trying to get across was pizzerias in general, New York pizzerias, are not using extra virgin olive oil. They're not. There might be, out of the 80,000 pizzerias that are in this part of the country, there might be 1% of them that do, okay? But it's just not something that is going to improve anything for them. It's going to hurt their bottom line substantially because extra virgin is a lot more expensive. A lot of these pizzerias are using vegetable oil. Okay, to, to oil the pan because it doesn't matter in the end. People are eating the top of it. They're they're getting the sauce, the cheese, everything. So go ahead, use your extra virgin olive oil if you want, John. It's totally fine. So you don't think the high heat that you're using to cook a Sicilian no, pizza? No. Well, okay. I don't think I don't think it would do too much. From what I understand, I mean, extra virgin smoke point is like four forty, mm -hmm. four forty to four fifty. You're cooking out at 450. I don't think it's getting to 450 at the bottom of that pan there. So I, I think it's kind of moot. I, I don't, I mean, ultimately, John, if you test it both ways, that's really the only way you're going to be able to find out yeah. 100%. And that's typically what I do. And when I tell people to do it, because a lot of like tropes and dogmas online, like I, I'll give you an example. This is different. So there was America's Test Kitchen said you could take a frozen steak and like rock hard frozen steak and it just comes out just as good as you know completely thawed steak so i you know initially i was like there's no way this is going to work i've been doing this a long long time okay a long time i've cooked so many steaks so i said you know what this is america's test kitchen it's got to be right then a youtuber made a video on it and he i think said it was good too so I did a Tara, right? And how was that steak that I made? It wasn't good? No, I mean, I did it. I did it in the pan. The technique, when was this? Uh, probably a few months, only a few months ago. Oh, the technique God. was, My, you I kept turning it. Seriously, with all the holidays and all that stuff going, like... Yeah, no, I don't. My memory is just yeah, not well, what you it know what? That doesn't, was. It doesn't surprise me that you didn't <laughs> rave about it because nobody raved about it. And, yeah. But we ate it. You're supposed to turn it every minute in the pan. Um that supposedly it's like you can get the same amount of brownness on it and you get even better cooking, they say. Because, really? Because by it being frozen, it gets a better 
uh, a better level of redness, like so mm. evenness in the whole entire steak. And no, there's there's a reason why America's test kitchen that steakhouses don't cook frozen steaks. <laughs> you know, they cook fresh steaks. That's why. And even when you put a frozen steak, when you once you put beef in the freezer, it changes the flavor for the worse. So that's one downside to it. But no, steakhouses a lot of times they have them. They they have all their steaks ready for that night. A lot of them I heard now are starting to experiment with like sous vide and or like the kind of a thing that has a steak almost done, and then they can just sear the heck out of it, get it out to the customer quicker. But I don't think any steakhouse will ever, ever have like we'll say we're cooking frozen steaks now. It's just not as good. Yeah, yeah. But I, I had to try it. it. I, I can't had to try imagine it. it being good. Yeah. All right. Next question. This is from Bert. Not your dad. Is this my dad? No. <laughs> Not your dad. I think his full name is Norbert. Oh. Not Bertram. Can I cook pork, ribs, or beef stew in my pressure cooker, then add to my marinara sauce, thus making it a Sunday sauce? If a yes answer, how should I spice the meat? Can you give recipes? If no, why not? Okay. So you can do anything you want, Bert. You can, all right? There is a reason why you would put the meat in the sauce from the beginning is it would better flavor that sauce. If you're cooking it in a pressure cooker, I assume you mean by itself, and then taking that meat and then putting it in your sauce, you're going to have essentially like a clean sauce almost, like a marinara with pressure cooked meat. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to have... The tomatoes aren't going to have that flavor yeah. of the meat cooking and absorbing into it. Yeah. So you could do it, but it's going to yield inferior results to making a Sunday sauce where you cook the meat. So you've made enough Sunday sauces in your life. What is the color mm -hmm. of the tomatoes when you first put them in the pot versus what is the color of the sauce eight eight hours later? Yeah. So the color when you put a fr like fresh tomato, it's like the color of a, of a marinara sauce. It's a, a bright red it's almost the same color as when the tomatoes come out of the can but if they've been sitting there and kind of melding and meshing with the meat maybe a little red wine for hours and hours and hours yep. it's going to be like a deep brick red which i mean i i think is is great i i personally wouldn't well of course you can marry a marinara sauce and pressure cooked meat i i wouldn't do it now maybe he means that he only wanted to cook the tomatoes for like 20 minutes and then take that pressure cooked meat to like save a ton of time that's like the a, only thing like I'm, a fast yeah. sunday sauce yeah. yeah you know what maybe it's worth exploring bert i don't know i i'm gonna say that in in some some situations the tried and true method is the best method uh i think it is in this case so that wraps up our questions today. Tara and I were discussing this right before we went on here. Leave us your comments in video form, okay? Your comments and questions. Now, depending on your technical capabilities, this will be easy or difficult, but maybe have your son help you, you know, or, or your daughter or whatnot. Because if you do do it that way, then we'll throw it up here during the video, you know, during the video podcast, the YouTube portion. Uh, obviously, if you're listening on Spotify or Apple, this doesn't matter to you at all. But if what you are listening- audio recording? Yeah, you, and that's the other one you said. If you are listening on Apple, Spotify, you will get an audio recording if you want to hear yourself. I think both of those are will be more getting the audience involved than just having a question uh, emailed. Yeah, and actually this came as a suggestion from Uncle Bob. Yes. Bob. Love yeah, getting Uncle his emails. Bob. He always makes me he's laugh. He's a real person. He's he's, not, he he's, is. Not, not a his fake, name is Bob. Bob not a he, fake Bob. He, <laughs> I think he, um, you always reference like a fictional Uncle Bob. So he just started calling himself Uncle Bob when he sends us emails. But he did suggest that maybe it would be good to get some more audience engagement by having them, you know, call. I think he suggested to call in and leave a recording. We don't have that type of capability to, to call and leave a recording. Yeah, we're, but, not, we're not going live here. We're, right, this is right. Recorded. This is pre-recorded. So if you want your voice to be heard on our podcast or you want to be shown on our video, send us a video or send us a recording. Yeah. 
of your a, question. With there's a lot your, of ways to do yeah, it. You can do it yeah. on Instagram. You can DM me or on Facebook. You can send the audio or a video of yourself, and then we'll just take it, add it in. If you don't want to do either one of those and you want to stick to the tried and true method, it's podcast at sip and feast dot com for your questions yeah. or just send the video or audio part in that email too. If, that, yeah. If, yeah. If you're capable, yeah. you know, capable of doing that, just attach it in there and get it to us. There, there's a, there's a multiple ways to do this, but um, we want to get you more involved here, more part of the process than, uh, than you have been before. And obviously if you are a Patreon member, you know that you are more part of the process over there too, because we have the discord connected uh, to the Patreon. And, you know, there's there's a sizable amount of people that love, that like to talk in that Discord now, which I'm happy about. I like, I would love to get it to the point, Tara, where I'm kind of like not involved in the conversation where people are talking to each other, you know, because that's what Discord is. Mm-hmm. You know, they can discuss among amongst themselves. And there are, there are some people that do that now. Yeah. 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 That's good. So anyway, that's a lot of stuff there for you. Just do anyone that, uh, you know, suits you. Yeah. Yeah. Until next time. Thank you. See ya.